Uh, welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. Today, this week, we have uh, Emma Slade. Emma Slade um, completed her PhD in Oxford University, and now she's a senior um, researcher at GSK. So Emma, thank you for doing this, and I'll leave the audience with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's lovely to be here, virtually, it's lovely to virtually be here. Um, yeah, so I was asked to give a talk about the different machine learning applications that we have at GSK AI. So GSK is obviously a pharmaceutical company. Um, and so because of that, although we obviously focus on biological data, biological data can take many different forms. And so the very broad types of data and types of questions that we're trying to answer from a biological level means that the uses of machine learning are extremely varied. And so what I wanted to do really was give an overview of um, two areas of research into machine learning at GSK that I've worked on personally. So active learning is what I currently work on, equivariant graph network, so what I previously worked on when I was a postdoc at GSK. And so the way I've structured the talk is it's kind of two talks smashed together. And the plan is to just give an overview, to give, to give kind of the first parts of both sections. So you get an overview of different areas of machine learning. And then if you have any particular questions, we can kind of dive into the specifics of either the active learning or the equivariant graph network section. So that's the plan. So um, there's a lot of slides, but I'm not going to go through all of them. So please don't be alarmed. I'm not going to talk at massively high speed to get through everything. Okay, so the first part of the talk is active learning. So um, this is based on a paper I wrote with the head of GSK AI, Kim Branson, um, and it's about the application of active learning for multi-class image classification. Um, and this is what my research group is currently based on, it's the field of active learning. So what is active learning? So active learning is a very old question in machine learning. Um, it, massively predates deep learning um, and it's a very simple question which is basically how do we maximize the performance game of some model so the model can be anything from linear regression up to the biggest transformer you can fit into as many gpus as you can buy how do we maximize the model's performance gain while annotating the fewest number of samples possible so the idea is you have a small relatively small training set, which you've trained your model on. And then you've got some amount of data, which is unlabeled. And you want to know in, in the active learning scenario, how do I pick data from this unlabeled set of data to add to my training set that's most going to improve the performance of my model? So that's great. That works fantastically. And that's a great question to ask, ask particularly in, on an industrial type uh, framework, such as myself working in a pharmaceutical company the problem is is as i said this predates deep learning deep learning is hugely data greedy you know more the more data the better so how do we kind of combine these two fields where one we're trying to do as good as possible with as little data as possible and we're trying to, and then the deep learning or we don't care about we just want more data the more data the better to improve the performance of the model how do we combine these two things so basically how do we do active learning in a deep learning paradigm. So this sounds counterintuitive. We want all the data, but also none of the data. But at GSK and the AI group, this is a particular issue. So the data that we use is you know, human samples of some form. And this data is not necessarily cheap to acquire or readily available. And it's very high dimensional. It's very complex data. Um, and you know, sometimes it, it, there's a physical cost to acquiring this, these labels to the data. You might have to actually go and ask a clinician to go and label a physical slide, a physical tiled image of some biopsy from a patient. So the problem is, is we're in this paradigm at GSK where we have this really high dimensional data that may be very low sample size. But when you go look into the literature of active learning, they try and tackle problem, open problem, open research questions in active learning with data sets where this doesn't apply. So they have they scrape Wikipedia, they scrape Amazon, for example, and they just got they have got infinite amount of data in effect. So they they're working in a completely different paradigm where they have relatively simple to understand class labels. You know, Amazon reviews good, bad binary classification, for example, just for the sake of argument, and they've got as much data as they want. We don't work in that regime. 
The additional problem that we have using medical data is it, there's huge amounts of noise in the data, of course. So just based purely on image classification, because that's what the initial work was on. Um, say, for, say, for example, you've got uh, an image of a leg and you've got a CT image of a leg and you've got an MRI image of the leg. The noise in that image is going to be completely different because you've used a different imaging modality. If you take the same person's leg and image it on two different MRI machines, they'll be calibrated slightly differently. So there'll be different noise even across the MRI machines and the patient might wiggle or whatever. You, know, you can't make a person st sit still for two hours without a tiny amount of movement. So there's all these different kinds of noise. And you know this is a very clear example of noise, but if you're, if you're working in the sequencing domain or some other kinds of data, it's more abstracted, the kinds of noise involved, because it might be that the sequencing uh, experimental equipment that was used was done in Germany, but the, the cells were from America and they were shipped across and the temperature was slightly different in the, when it was shipped over and that caused some of the cells to degenerate or whatever, you know, very noisy data. Very high dimensional, not many samples, big problem. So why do we want to tackle this seemingly impossible problem? And the answer is because we do active learning at GSK AI. So you have some deep learning model, which is trained on some biological data. And the question is, how do we go to experimentalists at GSK and ask them to do particular experiments for us, for which we hope the results of that experiment will most improve the performance of our models. So they, we have deep learning models involved in active learning loops at GSK. And so the purpose of this paper was to produce a proof of concept work, which kind of would work, do active learning in this regime, in this data regime, with minimal bias being introduced. So not assuming we have these, lo these lovely curated data sets, not assuming various kinds of different biases that exist in the literature and to build an active learning framework that can be used by the different groups of GSK AI while also being fun research. Um, so the, when I said we want to know what data is going to most improve our performance, that's a very vague statement I made. How do we assess the goodness of a data point before we've actually labelled it and put it into our training data? And this is in fact the question of active learning reframed from the machine learning point of view. So the, the way to assess what data is good is using something called an acquisition function. And we th these are the things that are used to estimate what data to add into the training pool of data. So the idea is you have in the, in, in the literature, it's called an oracle. You've got some way of labeling the data so often in academic research this is actually just trained labeled data that you've masked the label from um, and you want to query the oracle as few times as possible so that you can maximize the training accuracy or whatever the you know the model performance of a deep learning model while um, querying as say querying this oracle as, as few times as possible so in the case of the medical imaging situation this would be by asking pathologists as few times as possible to go label a slide for you because you want to minimize the cost of paying the pathologist for example um so that's that's the question what are the limitations i said there's all these, there's all these limitations we try to solve in this paper so what are the limitations so the first one is in order to determine what data to label next you have to use an acquisition function there are different kinds of acquisition functions which are trying to maximize or minimize or optimize different things. So you have to pick one of them, but that's a bias because it's assuming something about your data, it's assuming something about your model. So how do we not make a bias at the very beginning by determining an acquisition function? Problem one. Problem two, dealing with the, all the noise. Problem three, dealing with the high dimensionality of the data. So you've got the low sample, high dimensionality issue that we have, which is the opposite of what most people's data sets are. Um, number four is being able to pick lots of data at once. So when I um, introduced active learning, it was the idea of we add one data point at a time and then retrain the model and we add one data point at a time and retrain the model, which is fine if you've got a linear regression or a small random forest or whatever, because it's very quick to retrain these, these machine learning models or these numeric computational models, if you've got the biggest transformer in the world, adding, first of all, adding one data point is going to be kind of useless. 
And secondly, it's going to take a huge amount, a huge amount of compute. So we want to do what's called batch active learning, which is pick, say, as 10 data points to add that will most um, maximize the performance of your model, or pick 100 or pick picks n greater than one data points at once to add to your model. Um, because it's, otherwise it's just computationally vastly inefficient to add one at a time. Then number five is a specific issue in the literature, which is most people stick to binary classification tasks when, when they're doing classification tasks, just because, you know, binary classification is a lot easier than multi-class um, classification. So these are kind of the five issues that exist in active learning in the research literature, and these are the five questions we try to answer in this proof of concept paper. Um, so I will briefly give an overview of how we kind of solve the different issues and then I'll leave the results to be something that we can discuss later if people want to see results, I think, just so I can discuss the second part of what I want to talk about. So the first problem of how do we not pick an acquisition function while using acquisition functions is we take a meta approach. So we, we meta learn the acquisition function by using reinforcement learning. So we learn the acquisition function in a kind of black box method. And to do this, you have to reformulate active learning as a Markov decision process, which you can do relatively easily. So on the right, I've just got a screenshot from the paper explaining how you do this. Um, I'm not going to go through it. It's just there. It's in the paper and it's explained in the paper how you reformulate active learning as an MGP. But the idea is all reinforcement learning is based on the assumption that you can uh, formulate your question as a Markov decision, decision process. So until you've reformulated your question as an MDP, you can't use reinforcement learning. So we use reinforcement learning because active learning can be cast as an MDP. So once you establish that, that you can use an MDP, therefore you can use reinforcement learning, the question is then what do you do? Reinforcement learning is a huge field, it's a vast field. Um, so what we do is we use something called an off policy method. And so I'm not going to give an introduction to reinforcement learning because that would take like months and there's people who are vastly better um, qualified uh, introducing reinforcement learning to people, but we use something called a DDQN, which is an example of an RL based method, which would be the correct, a, a correct one to use for the question that we have. There's different kinds of um, reinforcement learning methods, and this is the, a particular kind of reinforcement learning that works for the task that we have. So what we do is we use this DDQN. So this is the agent in the reinforcement learning problem. So the idea is in reinforcement learning, it's kind of like a video game, which is you have an agent. I always use Mario for, I don't know why, when I'm trying to introduce reinforcement learning, you have some agent existing in an environment. So Mario jumping around on mushrooms and pipes and whatever, and it's picking actions to optimize a reward. So, the idea is what it wants this agent wants to do it wants to balance between what's called exploration and exploitation so it wants to ex explore the environment it's in so that it can find what's good and bad in the environment to optimize the reward but it also wants to exploit so it wants to when it finds something that's good it wants to keep doing that action again and again and again because it knows it's going to get a good reward it's learned this is a particularly good thing to do or it's learned this is a particularly bad thing to do never do that thing um, so the, what you want to do is you want to balance between the two. You want to make sure it, it can explore the environment to find good things, things that will give it a higher reward, but you don't want to get stuck thinking this is a particularly good action to take and we're going to keep picking that action and then not, and then not actually go looking for things that might actually give it a better reward. So in active learning, what this means is the agent is picking data points, which will maximize the reward it'll be given. So the reward is, um, the difference in the accuracy of the model with and without the data points that is picked. So you kind of, you very much abstracted out the active learning problem into, you now have an agent trying to maximize a reward based on the data points it's picking. So that the environment that the agent is living in is kind of the data space, high dimensional data space. But what this means ultimately after all that blurb is the agent in the reinforcement learning situation with this architecture that I've kind of um, shown here is the agent is able to pick diverse data points. So diverse across the different classes, all but, and also it's able to balance that with picking data points that, about which it's uncertain. 
Because if it's uncertain about a data point, it means it doesn't have a good understanding in the existing training set about what that data point means. So it probably means it's underrepresented in some form, This, the information about this data point. So it uses both of these pieces of information to pick data to add to the training set. And so this removes the bias of telling your active learning framework, pick data points that satisfy this particular requirement. What we say is you have information about, you can calculate if you're uncertain about the data point, you can calculate um, distance metrics about data points, like the closeness of the data to the existing data in some representative space. You can pick diversity, balance that as you see fit, and go learn what data points are good from your point of view. So that's how we um, remove the bias and pick an acquisition function. We don't pick an acquisition function. We make a reinforcement learning agent learn some representation of an acquisition function. That's point one. Accounting for multiple points, points of noise is easy. It's something everyone does in machine learning. You just add a bunch of noise to your training data and hope you're robust to adding huge amounts of noise. We are. And because we're doing medical image classification and we're using particular data sets, we know if we have MRI data, we know what kind of noise is in MRI data and we know what kind of noise is in CT data, et cetera. So we can add relevant no noise depending on the imaging modality that we have. So that's fine. Um, yeah, so we can add loads of noise to the, the entirety of the training set and the results are fine. The third one is dealing with the high dimensionality of the data and going beyond the binary classification. This is kind of automatically solved once you start thinking about deep learning. Deep learning loves high dimensional data and it loves multi-label classification tasks. So basically, if you throw deep learning into the mix, you solve these automatically at the cost of then, obviously, deep learning loves large amounts of data, but we're trying to to kind of balance that with the to learning anyway. So the high dimensionality of the data and the, the binary classification issue is solved by um, considering only deep learning based machine learning methods. So in this case, you know, a CNN or whatever, CNN trivially will do multi-label um, classification. And then the final one is this idea of adding multiple data points at once at each cycle in your active learning. So this is actually a very non-trivial thing to do. Um, because the question is, is how do you rank the data points? How do you know how many data points you want to label at once? You know, do you, do you add 10 data points at once? Do you add 100 data points at once? Do you add a percentage of the training data? You know, how do you determine this? And then also, how do you um, kind of, yeah, the, the, pro the main problem is like ranking this the data points with respect to each other is actually kind of it sounds trivial it's actually a very difficult thing to do so because we're using reinforcement learning what we do is we pick the end data points which the agent considers the best actions so as i said each action the agent picks is actually a data point and we just pick the top n of them and the value of n depends so we've done experiments where you can kind of you can optimize what n is depending on the data set that you're using so that's shown in this very disgusting equation that I've shown below of how we pick n data points at once in this patch active learning method. Um, yeah, so that is the high level overview of this work. I'm going to skip the results because um, I want to be able to discuss the second part of my talk. Um, just to say, obviously, we did experiments, there are results. Um, and what we've done is this is, as I said, a proof of concept work. Um, this was this paper was out in June, it's now obviously now October. Because I work in the private sector, because I work in industry, unfortunately, I can't actually discuss the work that's happened from June until now because it's not public. Um, suffice to say, there is obviously still lots of research going on and taking this proof of concept and continuing it. But I'm going to pivot instead, because I can't talk about it, and talk about other work that I've done while at GSK, which I can talk about because it's also published, and also gives you a nice overview of kind of very different kind of um, application of machine learning to the pharmaceutical industry. So that one was very kind of industrially focused, you know, maximizing the quality of your deep learning method with minimal data labeling. This one is crazy blue sky research that I did when I was doing my postdoc here. 
Um, and it stems from the fact that my background is as a theoretical physicist and I love group theory and I decided I wanted to do stuff with group theory. Um, and this led to some nice papers. So let me now pivot completely and talk about this work that I did with a colleague of mine, Francesco Farina, who was another postdoc in the group, um, on equivariant graph neural networks for molecular property prediction. Okie dokie. So let me see what the time is. Okay, 20 past five. So the idea of the the um, the project stems well it stemmed from the fact that my colleague pinged me and asked me if I knew about group theory and my response was yes I'm a theoretical physicist I did group theory for many years I love the stuff why are you asking the idea stems from the fact that symmetries exist throughout nature and they're crucial in kind of how we perceive and interact with the world as humans so not not as computers but as just as humans us actually us and the idea is without an innate notion of symmetry we would perceive all of these different threes as different pieces of information so obviously we all know this is just the number three that's been scaled and rotated and translated we know that it contains exactly the same amount of information as each other that's because we understand that the number three the information contained in the number three is invariant under rotation translations and scalings we understand that innately as humans. That's not the case with neural networks. So you can, in theory, learn symmetries by just giving an exhaustive data set to a neural network. So you take a standard um, multi-layer perception, throw the number three at it many, many times. Eventually, it's going to learn. If you just rotate the number three, it's actually the same thing. It's much more data efficient to embed the symmetry into a neural network architecture. This is what people have, of course, done. So the classic case is convolutional neural networks. Because you've got this kernel in the CNN. This means that CNNs are invariant under translations. Um, recurrent neural networks, which are used for kind of longitudinal or time-dependent data, are invariant under time warping. Transformers and graph neural networks are invariant under permutations of the data, so swapping the ordering. So these are these are two architectures invariant under permutations. And so that's the power of these, these architectures is because they're invariant under particular kinds of symmetries, they're much more powerful than just some multi-layer perception. So the question is, can we add more symmetries to our architectures to have even better data efficiency because you've got a much stronger inductive bias? So in order to do this, you need to think mathematically and you need to go to group theory, which is the mathematics of symmetries. So the mathematical formulation um, for the symmetry of some physical system um, is defined by some symmetry operation. It's normally a matrix, um, which are represented by group elements. So the idea is basically given it here in the kind of the formal context but the easiest way to think about it is you think about rotations and um under the son group so the S the son group is a group and it's represented by matrices and the application you apply the orthogonal matrices to your vector under matrix multiplication and the idea is if you are equivariant under um the SON group, you'll have this top uh, top um, result here, phi Q of X equals Q phi of X. So the ordering in which you apply your matrix Q doesn't matter. If you're invariant under the application of your rotations, it means the application of the matrix does nothing to your vector space at all. So equivariant is equivariance means the application of your rotation matters but just not the not the ordering of all of it invariance means it doesn't matter at all you, your result is exactly the same so that's the mathematical formulation uh, again this is all in the paper properly I've just got, I've kind of dumped it on you just so it's kind of there for your reference but I promised a high level overview so I'm not going to throw this at you but the idea is so we've got group theory and then we need to have a neural network, network architecture and so we chose to work with graph neural networks because we wanted to use this for molecular property prediction and molecules are obviously naturally represented as graphs. So a graph neural network um, is represented by nodes and edges. 
So the nodes of the graph have features of vectors with um, some dimensionality, NV. So this is the information embedded in the nodes. So in, in the molecule, for example, it can be all the um, atomic information about that element in the molecule. And then the edges are the things that connect the nodes. So it, it tells you whether or not these nodes are talking to each other in some form. So again, for a molecule, this is this would be a physical, actual, you know, a chemical um, bond between the two um, atoms, and then the information embedded in that edge would be all, all the uh, chemical information embedded in the chemical bond itself. But obviously, this extends to any kind of graph. It's just the idea of you've got some node, and then whether or not they're connected to other nodes are the edges, and then the neighbourhood of your node is just all of the edges that are. Um, all the nodes that are connected to that node based on the uh, whether or not there's an edge between the two nodes. And they can also have something called a graph level attribute or global attribute, U, which affects the entire graph um, on a global scale. So the classic example is if you've got some physical system, um, you may have, for example, a global attribute would be if you have like a planetary system would be like some the gravitational constant like newton's constant for example would be a, a graph level attribute because it affects everything equally it's like a constant um attribute across the entire graph so this is a graph neural network the way we kind of do machine learning with graph neural networks is we represent all this information flow between the edges and the nodes using update functions so we update the edges and the nodes depending on as we train the graph neural network and generally, these are just multi-layered perceptions. You can do other things. You can do, uh, you know, more complicated neural networks. But generally, stacking multi-layered perceptions is completely sufficient because of the universal approximation theorem. Um, and so, what this means is you can take some graph neural network block, like the thing on the left. You apply a bunch of updates to the nodes and the edges, and then you get a new graph neural network block, which has been updated based on, you know, minimizing the uh, or maximizing some particular metric of interest in your machine learning method. And in additional addition, in order to enforce this permutation invariance that graph neural networks have, so the idea is you can move the nodes around and relabel the nodes, but ultimately the result should be uh, invariant under this relabeling of the nodes. You have these things called aggregation functions, which just kind of permeates information across the graph in a permutation invariant way. So this is a graph neural network. It's just you stack basically these, think of the middle diagram here. A graph neural network is just many, many stacks of these things, just like a neural network is many, many stacks of an MLP. This is just like a one graph network block. It just contains many, many modulated perceptions. So graph neural networks are incredibly computation hungry because each block contains many stacked multi-layer perceptions, and then you have to stack the graph neural networks on top of each other to, to build a full graph network. So that's the graph network, and that was group theory, which was just the mass of symmetries. Um, how do we combine the two? So what we do is we take the nodes, which as I said, contain kind of atomic information in this case about the elements in the molecule, and we separate them out from each other. So we take all of the ones which have no information about the uh, coordinates or spatial information about the nodes, and we shove them into something called HI, which is just a vector. And then everything else, particularly the coordinate information about the atoms, are XI. So the node attributes are split between a concatenation of the coordinates of that particular atom, and then everything else. And what that means is we can use the spatial information about the atoms in the molecules to do things like build in translation variants, rotational variants, all that kind of stuff, because we know that we can use like Euclidean groups and various other kinds of groups on the coordinates. And that wouldn't work on the rest of the features about the molecule, because that can be anything. And then the beauty of this is as long as you have any kind of graph which has coordinate information embedded in the nodes, you can apply these methods. It doesn't have to be a molecule. It just, it's a nice example for it to be a molecule. You can have any kind of uh, network where you have coordinate information on the nodes to apply these methods to. So what we do 
is, for example, we introduce two kinds of graph neural networks. So one of them is called a uh, distance uh, graph neural network or DGN. The other one is called an angular graph network or AGN. And what we do for the AGN is we embed into the representation of the graph network, the understanding that the angles between the atoms in the molecules are in, can be invariant. So you can kind of extract angular information about the atoms because you've got the coordinate information about the atoms and calculate all the different angles between them. And so what this means is you can kind of create graph neural networks which are invariant under changes of the angles between the atoms or what we call a relative angle preserving map. So this is a formal definition. Just again, FYI, I'll uh, kind of not uh, go through in detail. But what the point of this is, is you have some molecule and there's a bunch of set angles between all the different atoms and you can update the graph neural network. As I said before, you know, you take, you update all the MLPs embedded into this thing and you can update it in an angular invariant way. With the DGN, distance graph network, you update it in a distance invariant way, not an angular invariant way. Why? <laughs> Why do we do this? The answer is because there are some very beautiful and very particular groups involved when you consider these kinds of transformations. If you update your graph neural network, preserving distances between the nodes, these are invariant under all Euclidean transformations. So these, this means these graphs are invariant under rotations and translations. If you update your graph with respect to maintaining the angles between the nodes this is a really big group called the conformer group which contains translations and rotations but also loads of different kinds of scalings so what this means is if you have a molecule and then you have like a zoomed in representation of the molecule this graph and all network will know that's exactly the same molecule so it's very very data efficient because it understands if you move distances around if you move angles around it's the same information it's just you've just kind of squidged the molecule around a bit. There's no additional information in doing so. So you don't have to give it many, many instances of the same uh, molecule. You just give it one and, and it knows intuitively because of this inductive bias. If you kind of spread the bond out or squish the bond, it's the same data that's ultimately represented. And obviously this is not necessarily the case for all properties of a molecule obviously if you increase the size of the bond if you, you know stretch the bond out between two atoms that, that does change the chemistry so this is particularly for specific kinds of um, properties of the molecules we're trying to predict you can't blanket apply this to everything and that's something we discuss quite heavily in the paper is like when is this a bad thing to do if you embed this very strong inductive bias into your graph neural network, you need to understand the data you're applying this to, otherwise you're going to make a bad choice. You're going to get some weird results and you're not going to understand why. So for the properties of the molecules we were looking at, this was a good thing to do. It may not be a good thing to do on properties of the molecules you're looking at. It may not be a good idea to do on any kind of network for which you have coordinate information. You know, you may have some network where distances between angle, um, angles between the nodes is really important, or the distances between nodes is really important. Like, for example, the traveling salesman problem is a very classic problem in, with graph neural networks. Literally, it's about calculating the minimum distances between nodes. You kind of need that information to be different. You know, you can't have that being an invariant feature. So you don't want to use that kind of graph network if you're doing something with a traveling salesman problem. So I showed the graph network, which was that nice three layered stack thing. This is the disgustingness that is the angular graph network. <laughs> so the reason it looks so nasty compared to before is because we are because you have to up update the angles in an invariant way. You have to introduce a bunch of additional uh, multi-layer perceptrons in order to do this, and then you have to you know keep the oil uh, aggregation and the flow of information consistent across your graph network. But what this means is before there were three stacks of modulated perception to update the node, the edge, and the global attributes of your graph. There's now five because you're updating the node, the edge, global attributes. You're now also updating the coordinates and you're updating the angles of, between the nodes. So this means this is even more data hungry 
and computationally, not data hungry, less data hungry, it's more computationally hungry than the normal graph net network, which is already very computationally hungry. So the data set that we uh, applied this to, which again, because I said I wouldn't use show results unless people wanted to see them, was an open source data set called QM9. It's a very nice standard benchmark data set for predicting chemical properties of some molecules. And we showed that lo and behold, being having the strong inductive bias was fantastic and we were super data efficient compared to other methods. The amusing thing was because we invented this angular graph network in order to, to do these experiments, which have all of these MLPs, we had to work on the Cambridge One supercomputer that NVIDIA have built. It's the largest AI supercomputer in the world in order to run these experiments because they're so computationally hungry that we um, we had a very beautiful opportunity to be able to use the, the biggest supercomputer in the world for AI research um, to run these monster graph neural networks on them. Um, so that's a high level of, of those that work. So let me just skip to uh, final remarks because um, I promised I'd give time for questions. Um, so the, the conclusion of this talk is I've given a very whistle-stop, very high-level tour of two very distinct different fields of the application of machine learning to GSK. So there's my current research, active learning, and my previous research, or subset of my previous research on graph neural networks. So as, as I said, because I work in the private sector, I can't tell you about what I'm currently up to in the last few months, but I now run a research group of three postdocs um, who are continuing the research into the application of active learning at GSK, and I'm currently hiring for engineers as well. Um, and because, as I said, this is a huge, huge problem in the industrial sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, particularly GSK, there's a huge amount of scope for development and interesting research to be done. This is just an initial uh, minimal viable product, as we call it, or MVP, like proof of concept work, showing the importance of trying to do quite abstract research for the, for the use of actually producing unbiased and um, robust models for application with GSK. For the GNNs, um, I can give more concrete conclusions because that work has been wrapped up. So the way in which we built these graph neural network blocks, these monster things, everything connected together, means that there's actually a huge amount of scope for application of these guys. So because group theory is a phenomenally beautiful um, mathematical construction, what the way we actually built these means we can if we have the right data set, we can deal with what are both called global and local symmetries. So global symmetry is a symmetry on the entire data set. So for example, this would be a rotation of the entire molecule in the case of molecules. A local symmetry, um, which is the context in the context of me being a physicist is particularly interesting, is symmetries applied to sub parts of the graph. So for example, if you just like rotate a bond, in the molecule, which may be a bad idea, maybe a good idea, it depends on the data set, depends on the task you're trying to do, you could um, generalize these networks, these graph networks, so that your data set is invariant under these local symmetry groups, if you wanted to. Um, and so what this means is because as a particle physicist, we care hugely about local symmetries, you can extend these approaches in theory to things like particle systems, um, which would be really cool. Um, because um, we chose to work with the coordinate features, this meant we were kind of using coordinate based invariances. And these are things which intuitively make sense to people. So were translations, rotations, that kind of stuff. Group theory is very general. There's no requirement on this at all. Um, you know, the conformal group is already very broad. It can deal with the scaling of the data on this kind of stuff. In theory, as long as you can embed group structure into your architecture of choice, you can in theory embed any symmetry into your architecture. We happen to choose you co coordinate based groups on graph networks. That was just a choice that we made. And um, as I said, like um, a huge amount of the work that we did was based on the idea of when is this a bad thing to do? Because generally, if you make a strong assumption at the outset, you need to be very confident that what you're doing is correct. And this applies both to the data that you're using and the questions you're trying to answer. 
you can have a fantastic idea about something if you've got the wrong data set it's ultimately a terrible thing to do so we show a lot of um, experimental work where we apply these data these graph networks to the wrong data sets and lo and behold things go very wrong for us um because you need to show that things are robust when they should be and not robust when they shouldn't be as well um but yeah so that is my very whistle stop tour of research done at gsk ai and i'm happy to take questions i see there are quite a few in the chat already thank you emma that's a very informative and a good overview of like what you've been doing uh, gsk if um if anyone have any questions you can uh, raise your hand um or you can type in in the chat and I can read them out loud for you. I see the chat was uh, technical issues. That's optimistic. Um, yeah, Ying Chen, do you want to go ahead? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, uh, very interesting uh, research. So, uh, I'd like to ask from your experience and also from your observation, like what kind of symmetry is the, the most important one in terms of like this, this say molecule domain, right? So I can tell you a bit of, con of context that uh, I do have a student trying to investigate uh, genetic models in uh, molecules and uh, previously we definitely try to respect a lot of say symmetries for example like a rotation symmetry or permutation symmetry but uh, one thing that my student told me that he uh, later on he actually tried a sort of like non a, a transformer model that does not respect any symmetry and then just you know increase the size of the model and it actually works better on this q and as a comparing to a uh, model that uh, uh, respects, let's say, rotation symmetry and also permutation symmetry. So that's the thing, that's the result that is unexpected, but and also puzzling, right? So I'm just trying to understand from your perspective, like what, um, what kind of symmetry would be mostly useful in this task? Yeah, so the 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 fantastic thing with transformers, so transform, depending on the transformers, Depending on the transformer who's using, there may have been permutation and symmetry in the set transformers are permutation invariant, but other ones are not. But the interesting thing with transformers is because of their huge uh, memory ability, you know, because of the tension mechanism in transformers, it means they kind of are so powerful that they don't need these strong inductive biases in order to learn a huge amounts of information about the data. The point of these strong inductive biases is because you may be in a regime where you want to be data efficient. So there may, obviously with QM9, there's 130 or thousand data points. So you don't need to be data efficient for QM9, but the, 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 the kind of the question we were trying to answer was, can we do this in a, can we do really well while being restricted by the efficiency of the uh, model? If that's not a concern, then a transformer is kind of the in the as of the last couple of years always the way to go is throw a transformer at the problem um i think from from my understanding from the state of the art results that were coming out a couple of years ago before people started throwing transformers at the problem was when once you made the switch from using a cnn to using a graph neural network that made a huge difference in the state of the art so it was the idea of in enforcing this permutation of variance seemed to be the really important um, symmetry to consider because the translation symmetries of the CNN were just being massively beaten by the graph networks. The caveat of that is like the transformer to the GNN, the GNN is to a CNN in that because they're so complicated, they have this massive ability to store information compared to a normal CNN. So it's a kind of difficult thing to disentangle the difference between the um, a kind of abstraction ability of your architecture versus the inductive biases that you're enforcing in the architecture. So the thing you, you would probably need to do in order to actually answer this concretely would be take a transformer that had the similar number of parameters as a given GNN and then do experiments between the two, because otherwise it's it's difficult to build, you know, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges otherwise. Yeah, I think that makes sense, right? But I think, uh, you know, uh, right now it seems to me that uh, uh, we are not lacking compute, right? So, yeah. and also for this QNI, QNI dataset is also um, relatively uh, decent size, 
right? Yep. So maybe just another relevant question, right? So from your experience at GSK, right? So what kind of, uh, uh, say, domain that you would say that still needs sort of like, say, a good inductive bias or like uh, what are the problems that are still like with small data? So something that we were thinking about um, taking this to that doesn't make sense. One area we're thinking about applying this to before we decided to kind of stop the development of this program was taking the existing inductive biases and the idea of working with molecules and trying to see if we can do like density functional theory calculations, trying to do DFT calculations, because these things are, although they're kind of embarrassingly parallel because you just run them across as many CPUs as you can throw at the problem because it's Monte Carlo in effect, they're still massively computationally hungry calculations to do at very high accuracy and any computational chemist, chemist at GSK is going to be doing huge amounts of DFT, DFT calculations. So we were thinking one thing that would be quite an interesting problem to do was can you take the inductive biases that you know work well for molecules and if you can make the computational demands of the graph network less kind of heavy can you do very high accuracy DFT calculations that don't have such a heavy kind of whack on CPU usage. This is very open. It's very abstracted compared to using QM9. But the idea is, can we take something which we know is computationally really, really, really ex extensive and see if we can do a little bit better by using the deep learning kind of, yeah, the strong inductive biases that we know exist from the molecules that we're trying to model. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Anyone else has any, any more questions? Um, in the meantime, Emma, I, I wanted to ask you about the GNNs. Um, how, does a, how does the process scale um, if you were to move to like very high dimensional systems? How computed, you, you keep on saying computationally hungry, but is, is that, will that be like a very big problem? So in terms of the dimensionality of the data, that's not the huge issue. Um, it can deal with, um very high dimensional data be because the fact that you're representing these is quite sparse often quite sparse graphs um the data is just in th so the node features are just matrices right the edge features are just matrices so these are quite easy to use on a gpu so the date the representation of the data itself as a graph is not the issue at all the issue comes from the fact that you have to stack these graph network blocks on top of each other so there was some research a couple of years ago which showed that once you get to about seven graph layers, things are going to start becoming very numerically unstable because you're just going to have so many MLPs stacked on top of each other that you're going to have you're going to you're going to always run into vanishing gradients or exploding gradients no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and we we did run into this issue of you know I think with us it was kind of starting to get a bit dodgy after about five graph layers were stacked on top of each other. So the computational hungriness comes from the fact that it's just each graph network block is so huge and you can't just have one of them, right? You need a deep graph network in order to do these complex prediction tasks. And at this point, you're just stacking so many MLPs on top of each other, it becomes really, really computationally heavy. Like mm -hmm. you need to run, you need to start doing things with massively parallel um, GPU usage and stuff like that. And in terms of like um, what you spoke about active learning and GNNs, um, is there any intersection that you see between those? How can you combine those two? What happen if you have like, you want some kind of active learning with GNNs? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So active learning is such a generic question. It's literally, as I said, it's literally how do you optimize a model's performance with minimal data? Yeah. If the representation of your uh, data is most uh, is best considered to be a graph. There, there is work on graph-based active learning methods. Okay. I think gen generally, the, the generally the thing is is the deep learning uh, kind of paradigm that we're in now is relatively new compared to the field of active learning. The field of active learning. There are some papers going back to the seventies here. Deep learning has obviously only exploded in the last 10 or so years. Graph mm. networks have only really exploded in the last maybe five years. Yeah. 
-hmm. So the, the, the kind of the combination of all of those is still very new. Uh, yeah. You know, with Transformers, this will probably only start happening in a couple of years' time once people have started having more of an understanding of the Transformers. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just um, there are there is some literature on graph network active learning, but not a huge amount. Okay, yeah, and um, and did, did you mention something that you can show a couple of results if on yes. a, yeah. Um, so, bu bu bum. so for the QM9 data set, so the idea is, um, for this is for the graph networks, the idea is you want to predict um, 12 quantum molecular properties of small molecules. So these are molecules containing only carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine, and there's 134,000 of them. And these are the 12, uh, 12 predict uh, tasks, it's just predicting these these uh, these values. So what we have is the on the on the x-axis is the number of training steps, and on the y-axis is the the loss on the test set. So it's the the, the prediction quality on the on the holdout set. Um, so excluding the noise because this isn't this isn't averaged over random seeds. Uh, this is just on one example. Um, you can see uh, maybe if you look at um yeah mu the top left one is cleanest i guess probably so you can see the agn and dgn here so the dgn does the best the um agn and dgn they reach significantly lower loss than the graph network so these are all these are all of the same size so this we have the same number of parameters across three different uh, architectures obviously that because the agn and dgn are bigger that means there's fewer layers of them but the idea is we want the same number of free parameters across the three architectures so that you can actually compare like with like. The AGN and DGN reach a significantly lower loss, like an order of magnitude lower loss. And they reach that point much, much faster than the graph network. So the, this is why we're talking about data efficiencies. You can achieve a lower loss quicker. And again, and these are all using the same amount of compute resources as well. So we haven't like allowed the AGN and DGN to have twice as much uh, GPU time or whatever. This is like trying to keep things as consistent as possible. Um, and you can see the AGN and the DGN, depending on the task at hand, one of them does better than the other because you know it may be useful or may not be useful to, to be invariant under these angular transformations, or it may be useful or not useful to be invariant under distance transformations. So again, this shows, depending on what you're trying to do, it may make sense to use one architecture over the other. You need to have an understanding of the task at hand, which hopefully you do anyway, you know. You need to understand what you're trying to predict. Um, we did other experiments with lots of other data sets. That's all in the paper. This is just one uh, particular example of uh, a data set and the results on that data set. So that's that. But active learning, bu 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 boom. Let me go back. So active learning. Yes, let me show you here. So we looked at uh, two data sets. Uh, one is um, a binary classification data set for pneumonia. So chest x-rays of pneumonia, not pneumonia. And the other one was histo whole slide histopathology images, eight classes for colorectal cancer. And the reason I wanted to do these two is because you would expect the state-of-the-art methods in, in active learning which are designed to do binary classification tasks to do better than our method because they're designed to do binary classification. And you'd expect them to do worse than our method on the multi-label uh, classification task because they're designed for binary classification. So the problem of these results is in all, there is there is basically one other meta-learning, active learning framework out there called LALRL. And in order, again, to be able to compare apples with apples, I needed to make sure the reinforcement learning agents were of the same size, of comparable size, same number of parameters for our method and their method. And their method was so computationally inefficient that it was tiny. And so I had to make our agent really, really tiny and really, really, basically I had to make our agent really, really dumb in order to be able to compare with their agent. So I had to have a really stupid learner and the whole point is I'm trying to learn things. So these results are like super conservative because I had to make our method really dumb in order to be able to actually run these experiments and, and fairly compare with the existing reinforcement learning framework. Um, but 
given that, it's, there's quite, it's quite a messy plot. But what you can see is R1 is in pink. Even on pneumonia, we beat the other ones, importantly. So like even on the case where they expect the other guys to do better, we do better than them. On the colorectal cancer, obviously we do better than them regardless. The second important thing is the error on our results is much smaller than the other ones, which means they're kind of more robust, more reliable results. So that's good in terms of stability of the method. The third one is we get higher accuracy quicker than the other methods. So we have this again, we have this data efficiency of we can label fewer data points. This is a number of annotations. We can label fewer data points and get to higher accuracy quicker than the other methods. So we take a really, really dumb agent and it still does better than the state of the art. And importantly, it is better than random because as I said, as I say to people, beating random is actually quite difficult sometimes. So we beat random, that's important. And we, and we beat the state of the art with a really, really dumb agent. So those are the kind of the, uh, as I say, very conservative results for this um, method. But it seems very promising to, yeah. No, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah, I think this one raised hand. Uh, Santiago, you wanna go ahead? And that will be the last question, I think. Yeah, um, Emma, thank you so much for your talk, first of all. Um, I guess let me preface this by saying I'm not an expert in, in graph machine learning, but um, from my understanding, like this, one of the simplest update rules for updating the node vectors would be to take uh, like an average of its neighbors and then you apply a transformation like that. And I understand yeah. that that's permutation invariant because you know if you relabel all the nodes, then your neighbors still remain your neighbors. Yeah. Um, and my question is, is that is that kind of graph architecture also angularly invariant? And if not, could you maybe give some intuition for what an angularly invariant um, architecture would look like? Yeah, so that's a really good question, actually. So the, the inductive biases that enforce the angular invariance, um, stem from the update choices of xi here so you see this is represented by phi rather than no psi rather than phi so that function enforces the angular invariance and the euclidean invariance in, in the other network the permutation invariance is enforced in these row functions at the bottom so they're different functions and they don't they don't interfere with each other so as long as you, these row functions are like you say for example the average um, across the nodes, the neighbors of the nodes, that will not interfere with the um, angular invariance updates of the um, of the nodes. So they're kind of they're inductive. They're both inductive biases on an equal footing, but they come in from completely different parts of the architecture. So they don't interfere with each other. You always preserve permutation invariance as long as you pick these rows correctly, which would be like an averaging, for example. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Um, yeah, it's 5 p.m. now. I think, um, thank you, Emma, for the great talk. It was very informative. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And uh, yeah, that'll be the end of uh, the seminar. Thank you, Emma, again. Thank you for um, thank you. sharing your time with us and showing us what you're working on. Great. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no Bye. worries. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>